thank you. And we give glory to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we appreciate Bishop Trout for this opportunity. And uh, Pastor Cook for also participating. And so without further ado, I'm going to get right into what I have to say. The, I'm speaking on behalf of the teaching of one God, the doctrine of one God, and in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let me start with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, which is the fundamental, or the foundation of the Old Testament, the fundamental creed of ancient Judaism and even to this day. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words that I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So here we have a clear emphasis, the fact that there is one God. That is to be taught at every opportunity. That is the foundation. That is the basis. A scribe came to Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, and asked him, which is the, great, the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So I am stating the proposition that there is absolutely one indivisible God. We cannot speak of God's plural. We cannot speak of persons of God. If we mean by persons, multiple personalities, multiple minds, multiple wills, uh, multiple bodies uh, in the Godhead. In fact, I would say you can't be in the Godhead. The Godhead is the quality of being God, and there is no one in the Godhead. The Godhead is not a, a substance. The Godhead is a person. The one true God known in the Old Testament as Jehovah or Yahweh, the supreme name by which he revealed himself to Israel. When he manifested himself in the flesh, he became Jesus, known as Jesus, which the word literally means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah is salvation. So there's one indivisible God with no distinction of persons. That's my first point. And my second point is Jesus is the incarnation of that one undivided Godhead. He is not one of three persons. He is not a subordinate person. He is not a second person. But he is the Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the incarnation of the fullness of God. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, we find this statement, speaking of Jesus Christ, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is the sum total of God's character, quality, attributes, personality. It's everything that makes him who he is. And God was incarnate or enfleshed bodily in Jesus Christ. When I say flesh or body, I'm not only speaking of the physical flesh, but usually in the Bible, flesh refers to human nature. And so I would say Jesus had the complete identity of humanity except for sin. Sin is a foreign element intruded into humanity. So I'm absolutely not saying that Jesus had a sinful nature, but I absolutely am saying anything we humans have, Jesus had joined inseparably to the Spirit of God so that you have one God manifested in the flesh as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I want to emphasize that. Now, the teaching of one God is persistent throughout the Scriptures and in such a way that it would exclude the concept of multiple persons. What I want to show you for a few moments, this is not just a, a minor point. This is absolutely essential to understanding everything else. Our doctrine derives foremost from the New Testament, but the Old Testament is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. If, if we are studying calculus and trigonometry, we've got to make sure the arithmetic is right. The New Testament doctrine uh, is first and foremost the clearest exposition of our salvation and so on. The fullest revelation of truth is in the New Testament. But to get us there, the concepts and terms have to be defined for us. And God did that through the people of God. Uh, of the Old Testament, the Jews. When we come to the New Testament, we cannot read it from the point of view of 4th century Greek philosophy. Take those definitions and then we see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost or one God or God.
Godhead, define it in terms of philosophy. Rather, we need to start from the Old Testament as far as our theological education, understand who the one God is and what it means to talk about Father and Holy Spirit and so on. And then when we have that clear understanding of those elementary things, then when we come to the greater revelation of the New Testament, we'll be in a position to receive it. Isaiah chapter 43, I'll just quickly give you some examples that show you the emphasis on one God and the strongest possible language. Not only the sense of unity of composite attributes, but a sense of absolute singleness, aloneness, numerical oneness, just like I am one person. I may have many attributes. You can speak of my body, soul, spirit, mind, will, but I'm one person who relates. I may relate in different ways, have different ways of self-revelation, different relationships, different titles, but in essence all those point back to the one and the same being. And the terminology of Isaiah is an example. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Uh, Isaiah 43, 10, the last part, before me there was no God formed, neither after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I am the Lord. Lord is in large and small capitals, signifying that in the original Hebrew, it was actually the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Not just the generic title Lord, meaning master, but the personal name of the God of the Old Testament. He said, I'm the only Savior. There's no other Savior beside me. Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. If you want to think of it symbolically or if you want to think of it literally, it's the same. But if you're expecting one God sitting beside another God or one person sitting beside another person, Jehovah God says that's not going to happen. I am alone. I, there's none beside me. Verse 8, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 44, 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. When he created, he did it all alone, and he did it all by himself. No one helped him. No one counseled with him. He did it by himself. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord. There is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 46, 5. To whom will you liken me? Make me equal and compare me that we may be like. So there's nobody that's God's equal. No one Jehovah's equal. Verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. There is none else. I am God and there is none like me. If you find someone who's exactly like God in every way, you've found God. Because there's no one who's exactly like God and yet a different being or person other than God. Well, I could go on and on, but I think you see the point. Number one, there's one God in the most absolute sense you could think of one God, numerically one, alone, by myself, none else, none beside me, none like me, and so on. I will not share my glory with another. Also, when we come to the New Testament, we find that Jesus is the revelation of that one God. Jehovah says, I am the only Savior. Let me... Uh, Read also in Isaiah 45, 21 through 23. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, have not I the Lord. There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, and righteousness shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That is a prophecy. Jehovah said one day every knee is going to bow to me, every tongue is going to swear or confess to me. That prophecy is fulfilled in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, where it says, At the name of Jesus, literally at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We do not deny the Father, but we confess Him. When we recognize who Jesus is, we are giving glory to the one true God, the Father, because the one true God has manifest Himself in the name and person of Jesus Christ. And so what we understand is Jesus is the fulfillment. Now Jehovah said everybody's going to bow to me. Jesus in the New Testament, is gonna, that's going to be the fulfillment. Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament revealed in the flesh. Jehovah says, I'm the only Savior. If you want to be saved, you have to look to me. How can we say Jesus is my Savior? Only if we recognize He's the Jehovah of the Old Testament manifest in the flesh. Now, when we say Jehovah of the Old Testament, 
Jehovah cannot be divided or subdivided. We're not saying one part of Jehovah or uh, one aspect of Jehovah. We're saying Jehovah, the one that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Jehovah, our uh, the Lord, is one Lord, is one Jehovah. There's only one. Now, you may ask, in that, if that's true, why does the Bible speak of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And let me say at the outset, we certainly do acknowledge the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we do not believe they represent different persons. As a simple human analogy, I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a husband. I have different relationships and different ways of making myself known. But I'm one person and my name is David Bernard. That's an analogy of how God can be our father. He's our father in creation. Uh, he came in flesh as the son of God, as our redeemer. And uh, he fills our hearts today as the Holy Spirit. Uh, God in action. He can do all those things simultaneously and yet be one God, not have separate minds or distinct minds or centers of consciousness. There's only one center of consciousness in God. We talk about persons, we'll try to define it. It's not a scriptural word used of God. The Bible never speaks of God as persons, plural, as three persons or as a trinity. And so I'm not just against uh, the words, because they're not in the Bible, but the concepts behind the words are not in there either. I find it counterproductive to use those words that don't relate to concepts. But if you're going to talk about persons, if you mean a role, if you mean a manifestation, I can say God was manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. The manifestation of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, that's fine. If, but if you mean persons in the sense of centers of consciousness, that there's one center of consciousness speaking to another center of consciousness, one center of consciousness thinking one thing and another center of consciousness thinking another thing. Go to heaven, there's one body sitting on this throne and another body sitting on that throne. Or one body on this throne and one, one invisible visible spirit that's not invested in that body that you see, then that's where I have a problem thinking you could have one God when you have these different bodies or different centers of consciousness or whatever. So if we're going to speak of God in a plural sense of persons, we have to define what that means. But God is our Father in the sense of parental relationship. The word Father is a term of relationship. Before my children were born, I was not a father. When they were born, I suddenly became a father. I did not change my nature, my personality. I didn't split into two. I didn't become a different person. But I entered a new relationship. And I'm just pointing out, when we say our Father, God our Father, we're speaking of God in relationship to humanity. Deuteronomy 32.6 speaks of God as the father of the nation of Israel. Malachi 2.10, God is the father of all creation. And so on. In a unique way, God is the father of the baby Jesus because Joseph did not cause the conception. The one who causes conception by definition is the father. And the spirit of God supernaturally caused a virgin to conceive. So God was literally the father of the baby Jesus. That's all relationship to humanity. God is the father of born again believers. That's a relationship. The Bible speaks of God as the Holy Spirit, not a different person. God is the only Holy One. Over 50 times, the Bible speaks of God as the Holy One. Never Holy Two, Holy Three, Holy Trinity, anything like that. Always Holy One. God is a spirit, John 4, 21, 4. There's only one spirit of God, Ephesians 4. And so when we say the Holy Spirit, that is not a different person from God. That is God in his spiritual nature. And that title speaks of God in spiritual action. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was out form, void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. First mention of the Spirit, God in action. When we think of God in relationship, we pray our Father. When we think of God in spiritual work and action, we say the Holy Spirit is moving here. We don't say the Father is moving here because that implies we're looking for some personage. But we say the Spirit is here. We know we're talking about the invisible power and presence of God. The Son is God manifested in the flesh. The Bible never says the eternal Son, only the begotten Son. It never says God the Son, always Son of God. Luke 1.35 tells us why Jesus is the Son of God. The angel told Mary that, uh, uh, that the Holy Ghost would overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Therefore, because God is causing the conception, that's why the Son is called the Son. When the fullness of the time was come... Galatians 4, 4, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. The, the son is the human incarnation of God. God manifested in the flesh. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God. And it's all wrapped up in Jesus. In him dwelleth all, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
1 Timothy 3.16, God manifest in the flesh. Titus 2.13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. John 20.28, 20, Jesus is called my Lord and my God. John 1.1 1, 1 and 14, the Word was God, with God, was God, and the Word became flesh. There's no doubt that Jesus is the one true God. When we say the one true God, we mean the God of the Old Testament, all of His fullness. He is revealed as the Lord Jesus Christ.